So no fear of going into the land of the academic in preparation to do this? You know what, I'm, I'm a little nuts. I spend quite a lot of time sourcing uh, from all over. I found at the moment, uh, you know, uh, Machiavelli, Voltaire, Isaiah Berlin, and Kant, and all kinds of people like that interesting, as well as, you know, Chris Hitchens and uh, Ed, uh, Harris, a different Harris. Um, all kinds of people, I find that and this is going to sound a little bit weird, but I allow myself to simply be curious and be interested in all manner of things, whether it's sharpening Japanese knives, which is how I got that, and, and reading philosophy, the Bible, whatever it comes to hand, believing somehow that all of this is going to go into the cauldron that is whatever this performance is going to be, and it will be useful. I will pull out something by the hair and say, ah, Yes, Machiavelli said something interesting about that. Bacon said something interesting about that, that I can dredge up and use. So I find that useful. A lot of people may think it's ridiculous, but for me it gives me a sense of security while trying to be free enough to just go, oh, I don't know what's going to happen here. And, okay, let's see what else they've asked us here. Um, Colin, there's a question here for a man who's playing Cyrano and the Scottish King. How do you switch between two such different characters? You did both today. Uh, I find that they're complementary. And that that's why I like this season so much. I think that Cyrano is is the antithesis of Mackers. It, 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 what is one is diving into a terribly dark hole that is the human being, human nature at its perhaps worst and simplest, and something that we recognize in all of us, but dare not go to this abyss. And the other is all about spirit, inspiration, intelligence, humanity, goodness, uh, our fellow men, the community of it. Very much, uh, I think, Rostand was grabbing all of the best of French intellectual thinking, Renaissance into Enlightenment, Voltaire and stuff, and he stuffs it all in so that there's an exuberance and a, a, an intelligence and a, uh, an extraordinary energy that this guy has for good and hope and purity and love and romance, and the other guy goes that way. So for me, they're actually terrific. I can do them both in the same breath uh, because they complement each other. At least I thought they did on the surface. Maybe by September I'll be mad as a hatter. But right <laughs> now it makes a great deal of sense. That's great. We'll check in. We'll have an interview in September. Please, please see if he's split. See, yeah, see how, what, what he's like then. Um, there's a question here about Macbeth. Driven, is he driven by his own moral choices, Des, or outside or supernatural forces? Well, <laughs> that's right to the heart of it, there, in a way. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I think we all have to take responsibility for the choices we make, regardless of our belief system. And so uh, I, I do not believe the the, uh, the weird sisters, uh, you know, cause Macbeth to murder Duncan. I do not believe that for a second. Uh, on the other hand, there is definitely a dark spiritual ride going on here. And Macbeth is not just about a single character. It's about an entire country falling into a... a uh, you know this this uh, this tragic nightmare, and everyone's culpable and everyone's tainted. Uh, it's not just Macbeth's decisions; it's Duncan's decision to name Malcolm, the Prince of Cumberland. The scene we were just working on. Uh, you know, there's there's a myriad of decisions that go into this journey. I, I would say though, Macbeth, his his decision making is is of course central the the spine of 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 the tragedy and i think he does need to take responsibility for those decisions and in fact he does hmm. and column there's a question here about the love story between macbeth and his lady mm. well it is that most assuredly i think that unfortunately because the play is so condensed and so elegantly streamlined it's, it's only revealed in retrospect as we see a relationship that when we, we meet them together, they've all made commitments, not shared secrets with each other, and so the relationship is actually on its way to falling apart. But it's been such a profound love that they, they are such good friends, and there's so much willingness and desire to share everything that they really, I mean, we see it, uh, I know Yana and I do, as uh, they're one. They are, they complement each other perfectly, and so they are so excited to share the intimate details of each other's joy and despair. And and I think it's only because of that 
that the rest of it, as it de decays and disintegrates, is, is, is ever more heartbreaking and touching because we see what was and what could have possibly been some, an extraordinary reign. But. As you talked about coming to the play the second time as, and looking at it as a story of a couple trying to have a child, not having a child, the career, replacing the child. Tell us a bit about that. You know, I, I think that, uh, Colm was just talking about the secret between them, and, and they are both characters that subscribe to certain elements of superstition. And in fact, at different points in the play, they both quite literally conjure. And, uh, you know, she, uh, they have not had a child together. Historically, Lady Macbeth had uh, a, a, a child in, in another marriage, so there was no uh, question about her ability to have children. And, uh, you know, there, there may, you know, you can imagine the whisperings that go, in, go on. This great warrior has not fathered a son. And she makes a kind of unil unilateral decision when she learns about the sisters to literally, to give up her womb, to give up her ability to have children so that he can uh you know, become king. He, she trades literally the child for the, and she, they never discussed this. Now, whether she literally does that or not mm. is arguable. I think she, in fact, becomes more feminine as the play uh, moves forward. But that secret <laughs> literally tears them uh, apart. And th the deeper we go into the story, the more, of course, Macbeth wants desperately to secure the future by having that child. Um, but I, we've all seen and known, uh, you know, couples who, who do that, who decide to make the career the baby and put everything and all of the energy uh, into that. And this particular case, I, I think as Calm just said, it comes out of a profound love and a very, an, I think probably a, a, a very sexual relationship. Absolutely. And so the, the heartbreaking part is what we see as it falls apart is the vestiges of this, the, the shapes, the actions that, that were so familiar, so intimate and careful, but in such a dark you know, th the things that have happened are so horrifying that they are now trying to cope with. Their little touches of domesticity are even more frightening. So it's, it's, it's a very rather terrifying journey. But and the awful irony of having to get rid of Banquo and then finding out that his children, I mean, you know, he went to a lot of trouble, and his children? Yeah, no, really, that, that's not very good. Yeah. I get, my fit comes on again at that point. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see what else there our viewers uh, have asked us about here. Um, what does a play like Macbeth require of audiences who may have already seen several productions? So I guess it comes down to how how do we, why would we come back to a text that we've seen? You know, I, I, I go ahead. Good. No, I, I go. I think that's you a go. very good question. I'll write this and, down. And I, th I think one of the things that we all have to do when we go to the theater, I mean, when, when I go into the theater uh, for, to see anything, you know, I, I want to have my life changed. Uh, I really do. And, and I have hopes that maybe it will happen. And it has in the past. I think it's really important to not drag around too many preconceived notions, even if you're not, especially if you're very knowledgeable about a play, that I think it's that sort of childlike sense of wonder that needs to lead us on. Any time you take, a re we have a remarkable company of actors. Mm -hmm. um, and th th this season I think the company is particularly strong. Any time you take great talent like that and you, you couple them with one of Shakespeare's masterpieces, you know, you stand the char chance of creating living art. And uh, I, I think it's a great advantage if people, uh, you know, know the play, as long as they don't want to simply recreate an experience they had, you know, five years before. I think this is where we can all uh, get in trouble with that word tradition. I think tradition too often means not you know, 400 years of doing this, but just the last couple of productions right. we've seen. So yeah. I, I would just say, you know, 